once you've hit that rock bottom and you, you, you get this thing about something changes inside of you, you feel like you have nothing to lose anymore. It can't get any worse than that. Mm. And I think that does something to your spirit. I think you, it awakens your spirit. And I do feel bad for people who haven't had significant adversity in life because I don't think sometimes their spirit wakes up. Hey, what's going on? You got the 7-2 Mindset Investor here. I am so ecstatic to have just an amazing guest today, Ron Maholtra, the Indian Lion. And, you know, I connect with Ron literally uh, less than a month ago through Clubhouse, actually. And it was, I was, you know, hearing someone that was where I wanted to be. And it just shook me, it rattled me. And our relationship has just taken off. And I feel like I've known Ron and, and Caroline and, and the team for now for decades. And to introduce you to Ron, um, people ask me, you know, it's funny, someone asked me saying, oh, I know you're connected with Ron. And how can you describe Ron? And I said, <laughs> the way I describe Ron is he takes, he is the Grant Cardone and Dan Locke of Australia, but at a higher level in how he talks at, a, at such a deep level and connects the dots. And it's all about transformational relationships. And that's not to say nothing bad about Grant or about, about uh, Dan, but there's just a different level to this. And for those of you listening for the first time, you, you will know what I'm talking about here. When Jack Canfield, the author of Chicken Soup for the Souls, says Ron Maholtra, you know, will help you increase your confidence. He will live with purpose. He'll show you how to live with purpose and passion and realize all your abilities. And then on top of that, we have you as an award-winning wealth planner, a renowned a thought leader, entrepreneur. You've written multiple books. I mean, Impossible to Fail, Move Forward or Move Aside, Eight Wealth Habits for Financially Successful People, Make Your Life Matter. This book just came in a mail for me today, which is uh, Ron's book, which is called How to Speak Like the World's Top Public Speakers. He recognizes most of my global Indians list of 2019, top 50 most influential men on LinkedIn in 2019, top 50 emerging icons in education. I mean, wow, Ron. <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, you make it sound pretty incredible. Um, but thank you, and thanks for having me on the show. And I feel I feel the same way, Mark. I feel like we've been connected for a while. And uh, what a great platform Clubhouse is because it gives us the opportunity to connect with people in real time. And I think this is the magic of Clubhouse is that in contrast to the other social media platforms, we're communicating in real time. There's no, we don't have any scripts. We don't have time to prepare. Um, you know, it's impromptu. And you know, it's, it's, it's spontaneous connections. And I think that's what's happened with, with uh, how we've connected. And I'm glad that you've had the opportunity to connect with our team members as well. Of course, we're all philosophically aligned, which is why we work together. Uh, but thank you for having me on the show and, and congratulations on the wonderful work that you're doing. And I love the name of the podcast as well. Um, and appreciate you mentioning all the things that I have done. I, I suppose I have, because I was, I was an underachiever for so many years. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one of the things that happens in life is whatever you perceive to be missing the most in your life sometimes becomes your highest value. So I, I, was, I was taunted and teased so much about underachievement when I was young that uh, I, I suppose in one way I really value achieving things. Um, but, but over the years, my, my attitude towards achievement has changed in that I look at achievement as something that I must do. It's my obligation. But how I go about it, meaning I must examine the consequences of that on me and people around me so it has to be done the right way and i think when you when you compare me with uh, people like dan Locke and, and grand cardone people who i respect very well because of their work ethic and consistency uh, these guys are absolute masters and geniuses at positioning themselves and they're very strong personal brands i think the the you know and i'd love to be at that level because I, I i see them as aspirational figures but i think that one of the things that that has happened to me over the years is this, you know, this constant evaluation of what I'm doing and why I'm doing it. And, and being able to integrate the business and financial world with the spiritual world. Mm. And I find that that's where not only do I feel like I achieved the most, but I also feel the deepest sense of accomplishment and peace in doing mm. so. And, I see, I, and, I, and maybe that's what you're referring to when you talk about uh, the, the point in point of difference because I enjoy everything about the business world and the financial world 
But what I realize is the magic happens when you integrate that with spiritual principles, because then you are being mindful of the, the moral obligations that you have whilst you're achieving um, success for yourself and your family. Absolutely. Uh, and, that, and that's what I really enjoy about our conversations that we have. It's you bring a holistic approach. It's not just one dimensional sales or wealth or what have you. you it's all encompassing. And you talk about this, that one can exist over the other, the other, they have to be coexisting and co-elevating and, and very few people in the world are talking about that. And I think this is where we had that connection. Yes. And I, it's been especially challenging for me as well, because I've always had that inclination because I've always looked at things as being holistic, but the challenge was that as somebody who is in, who is an online entrepreneur as well. And you would have heard the, the conventional marketing advice to niche or micro niche in a particular area to stand out. Mm -hmm. That's been very difficult for me because I, even though I believe I have deep expertise and skills that I have acquired over the years, um, I, I, I don't want to anchor myself to one concept because I do see that, the, that, that, that life is holistic in, in nature and being an achiever or being accomplished in one area whilst neglecting other areas consciously or unconsciously, to me, is not something that's worthy of praise. And so mm -hmm. I feel, I felt that, number one, I must, I must look at the world holistically and I must look at success holistically. But then number two, I must define all the elements that contribute to holistic success. And then the question I ask myself is, is it possible for a human being who is highly conscious to have it all, mm -hmm. to have it all? So not just have great health and be broke, or have lots of money mm -hmm. and be unhealthy or have money and health, but not have influence or have money, health and influence, but not have meaningful relationships. Is it possible to have it all? Is it possible to have high achievements that you are proud of to leave a positive legacy, to make a difference, to make an impact, to have great influence, um, but have financial abundance, but also be at peace and find inspiration and meaning in what you're doing? And so I started asking that question, is it possible? Because the reason I had to ask that question is because here I am at the age of 43, I have never seen people who have it all. So even growing up, I remember, you know, I, I, I was fascinated by people who were successful financially. And one of the things I observed was that people who were fin successful financially, I only wanted to emulate one part of their life. Mm -hmm. So, you know, because they, they didn't have the other parts of their life together. And, and I think if we have, because what happens is I think subconsciously we perceive success to be this thing, which has to result in a massive imbalance. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so I thought, is it possible? Is it possible perhaps that I can be on purpose? I can, I can have an inspired existence, meaningful work, which is aligned with my values, my purpose, and my passion, make a positive impact on people, make positive difference be very good in business and money because we do live in an economic world and it's something I want to master. Is it possible to have great health and vitality and energy? Is it possible to look good in terms of appearance and grooming and styling? And is it possible to be authentic at the same time whilst you're doing that? Mm. So that's where I started asking myself that question. And as we, you and I both know from a mindset perspective, uh, the quality of our life is very much determined by the quality of questions we're prepared to ask ourselves. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to ask myself, if, is it possible? And if it is possible, why don't we see a, a lot of examples of people who embody that holistic success? Mm -hmm. And even if, even if you're not seeing too many examples of people who are embodying that holistic success model, is it possible that we can step into it and lead through ex being an example? So for me, it's just become an aspirational quest to be a holistically complete human being. Uh, and not to deny anything prematurely in, you know, a lot of people are quite righteous in terms of, oh, you know, it's, it's not about money, you know, for me, it's about peace and happiness. Uh, but, but for me, it's about, hang on, let's not deny any side. Let's see if we can integrate them first. Mm -hmm. uh, and if we can, then to me, that would represent a holistic model of success and fulfillment. Uh, so, uh, you know, and, and I'm happy that I did that because the more you search for answers, the more you find that anything's possible provide your belief system is not getting in the way of, or it's not polarizing you. And I, and I find this is the problem in 
in believing anything prematurely. How, how long can you remain in a state of mm -hmm. not having any belief in anything mm -hmm. and, and waiting and trying things over a period of time and evaluating the outcomes from it and then perhaps uh, grabbing onto a belief rather than, you know, because it's, it's a human need. We want to believe something because it, it gives us some centeredness. It gives us an anchor. But I think the, the tendency to do that quickly and prematurely can sometimes get in the way of our personal development. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, thank you so much for sharing that. You know, many of your, of your mentees have said, Ron can look, can look, has the superpower to look into our souls and unleash the beast, unleash that potential. Is that something that's a gift or it's something that you've mastered? Well, if it's a gift, then I would say everybody's got that gift. So, the, uh, you know, I, I, I suppose it's a gift that everybody has. And the gift that they're talking about is the fact that when I, when I look at a human being, what I try and do, and I have to remind myself of this, is, is, there, a, is there a way perhaps that I can see their, their spirit before I see their, their mind and their body? Because the mind would typically be an accumulation of beliefs and conditioning that they've acquired over the years. The body, again, you know, based on how they dress and how they appear, can sometimes cause us to not really see the person and see the personality. So is it possible for, for me to perhaps to see who they are beyond the facade of the appearance and the personality and the cultural conditioning and the, and the identity that they require through um, religion or, 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 or education? Uh, can I see beyond that? And, and, and so, um, you know, if I'm speaking to Mark, who is Mark? Be, beyond the name and beyond the, the, the status and the position that he has, uh, beyond his financial uh, situation, uh, who, who is Mark at the deepest level as a human being? If I can, if I can see that, uh, and that's what I try and see first, because if I can see that, then I know that I'm seeing the most powerful per, part of that person. Mm -hmm. And... Um, I think we have an obligation as you know, people like you and I who are in this space of developing people or enabling them see their potential. I don't think we can do that if we are not looking beyond the facade mm -hmm. because minds can be distorted and contaminated. Personalities can be warped, uh, but the spirit is pure. And, uh, and, the more, and I also strongly believe that the more we are operating out of spirit, the more powerful we are, mm -hmm. the more we expand. Uh, and the more value we can create, the more we're operating from the mind of the body, the more animalistic we tend to be and more instinctive we tend to be. And mm -hmm. I think that restricts uh, our growth in life. Uh, right. So by seeing people's, you know, by seeing their spirit or attempting to see their spirit, uh, number one, once I can see it, then I can get them to see it mm -hmm. and, and get them to acknowledge that most powerful part of them, which in most cases, because of cultural programming and educational programming is the part that people suppress the most and they don't mm -hmm. acknowledge it, but that's the part that we want to unleash. Right. Yeah, no, I, that, I appreciate that, Ron. And I just, I really appreciate your humility as well. Um, one of the words that you use quite a bit, you know, in, in your books, uh, yeah, do you have a book that's actually called a magnify make your life matter magnify seems to be a, it, it appears that is your mat like that is the word that's your tagline magnify what does magnify mean to you ron well as part of um, when we when i was building my my own personal brand and i and i needed to build a personal brand because i knew i had a powerful message but i knew that if i don't have strategic visibility around who i am people are not going to even give me the opportunity to be able to convey my message mm -hmm. So when I was building my personal brand, a question that I asked myself was, if there was one word that would represent what I stand for and it would encompass my entire philosophy on life, what would that word be? And so I had to do a lot of soul searching to ask myself, what is the thing that I'm so convicted about that I would stand by that philosophy for the rest of my life, regardless of what the consequences are? And as I looked at my own life and I evaluated what I believe in, that what I strongly believe in, and I have very good reasons to believe in this, I realized that I'm a maximalist. I'm not a minimalist. I, I, mm -hmm. I believe if there's such a word called maximalist, mm -hmm. I think it would indicate that I'm all about maximizing everything that you have, maximizing your time, maximizing your resources, maximizing your potential, maximizing the value that you give to the world. Uh, so I'm a maximalist. And if you actually look, even in my background, my whole house is like this. I have, 
I have, I surround myself with things. If you, if you look at a minimalist, for example, that have a, you know, they may not have much. And that's a beautiful philosophy in itself as well, but it's never, ever appealed to me. Mm-hmm. I, I'm all about maximizing the whole spiritual experience and maximizing the human and physical experiences, but mm-hmm. not denying myself either. So magnify to me represents taking something and intensifying it and enlarging it. So I look at where, where I came from, what background I had, what I was given, and then what did I do with it? Did I, you know, I, I have taken that and I've intensified that and I have enlarged that. And I realized that for those who want more in life, this philosophy may resonate with them. And through this philosophy, I can serve those people in doing the same, if that's what they want to do. Mm-hmm. And, and then that's, and I, and I suppose that concept is so interconnected with the concept of success, because I ask myself, what are all the ingredients one would need in order to enlarge their life to the max? Mm-hmm. What are all the things that they would need to know and apply for them to be able to intensify their life? So they're not just uh, living in obscurity. They're not just living, uh, they're not living, they're not, they, they feel strong about themselves because mm-hmm. a lot of people feel weak about their existence. Mm-hmm. And that's why, and that's why even the Indian lion, the whole, for me, the Indian lion is simply the fact that I think the lion to me represents courage. And, 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 and that's the quality that I wanted to embrace the most. And I think Winston Churchill has a wonderful quote that without the quality of courage, no other quality works. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, so that's what magnification is for me. It's about how do I take an individual who wants to get, who wants more, because a lot of people don't want more, or they've somehow convinced themselves that the pursuit of more actually makes you a bad person. I don't believe that because if I look at, if you look at nature, you see how wasteful and abundant nature is. You know, I've got it's um, we're just coming out of winter, and I have these beautiful Japanese maple trees in my backyard, and uh, they. Typically, uh, they lose their leaves in, in, in winter, and now the leaves are growing back. And I saw the first leaf pop up, and the next day, the very next day, there would have been hundreds of leaves. And I, and I remember thinking, you know, you can't even count the leaves on a tree. This is how abundant nature is. So why is it that we feel that us thinking in, a, in abundant terms and, and, and having abundance in our life, why, does, why do we automatically assume that that makes us greedy Mm-hmm. when nature is so abundant so i um yeah I'm, I'm very much about that philosophy and i think the word magnify kind of ties in beautifully with that yeah no and i, and I love how you brought that 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 par- uh, parallel with nature because it's so true because ultimately that's what we're going with is what's around us our environment and if the environment that we're trying we're positioning ourselves in is about abundance like nature um and again it, it goes back to what you said before which is probably a result of our programming or i.e conditioning um, so, um, Ron, the name of the podcast is called, um, the seven Two mindset investor podcast. When, um, when I first started the podcast, it was actually called the real estate investor podcast. And I actually changed that because I quickly realized that real estate was simply a vehicle and it was me pouring into myself and making heavy investments into myself, my environment and so forth, where I made the, the pivot to be to call myself the mindset investor. The seven two um, is very important to me and it's a movement. Um, the seven two in poker is the worst possible hand. It's when you pull a seven card and a two card when you play poker. And most people will tell you when they get a seven card and a two card in poker, you wanna fold that hand because mathematically speaking, it's a bad hand. In life, we can't control the hand that we're dealt, but we can control how we play that hand. This podcast is called The Hero's Journey because individuals like yourself have had a bad hand in their life and they decided to play that bad hand and it changed the trajectory of their life. If you're comfortable, could you share a moment in your life where you had that bad hand and you made the decision or choice to play that bad hand and that changed the trajectory of your life? Yeah, and I think I think it would be the same for anybody that is out there wanting to impact humanity in any way. I think I would I would imagine that majority of those people would have gone through significant struggles in their life, and because they were able to overcome them, they feel almost a a, a very strong pull to uh, enable others do the same. Um, 
what we call bad experiences, now I see them as very positive experiences because they obviously were blessings in disguise. I mean, mm -hmm. I wonder if I would have had the level of determination to work on myself, would I've had the tenacity to persist if it wasn't for those experiences. And I would, I would probably argue that I wouldn't be the person that I am. Um, in the beginning, I had a bit of a chip on my shoulder because of those experiences and I didn't really trust people. Uh, but the experiences that I've had, look, I came from a background. I mean, I was born in India and uh, I migrated to Australia in my early teens. Um, my, both my parents are good people, um, educated people, and they worked hard. Um, but there was family problems. Uh, and so we grew up in an, a very volatile environment. Uh, and uh, I, you know, I just felt, I mean, I started <laughs> the I was rebellious because I didn't have, I didn't feel like I, I had peace at home. So when you have so much volatility happening at home, um, you feel like you can't trust anybody. And so I, I was literally forced to grow up very quickly because I felt like I needed to fend for myself because I, I knew that they, I, couldn't, I couldn't trust what was happening at home mm -hmm. and there was no stability. Um, and so I, I had, I was, and I, and I didn't realize it's only now that I, I look back and I think I was suffering from my anxiety because I didn't want to come home because I didn't know what was going to happen. So I became street smart in terms of I spent a lot of time out, out, out of home and um, meeting new people and things like that and got into a lot of trouble growing up. Uh, got into fights occasionally because I had all of this ambition, but there was no way to channel it without guidance. I had all of this energy building up inside of me and all of this frustration because nobody was acknowledging that. Um, and so uh, by the time I was in my early 20s, I mean, I had moved out of home pretty, pretty young um, and I moved into a commission house with five guys uh, and the commission house, I don't know how the commission housing structure works in Canada, but in Australia, commission houses are reserved for delinquents, drug addicts, ex-convicts. Uh, it was the only place I could afford. It was a three, three bedroom weatherboard house and there was five of us living there. And I was the only person that had a job at a supermarket. So I used to work at the supermarket and pack bags. Um, and one day I came home uh, because I was the only one working. None of these guys used to work. Uh, one day I came home, there was a fleet of police cars parked outside the house. And when I, when I, as I walked towards the house, one of them looked at me and he said, is your name Ron? I said, yes. And he said, we found drugs in your room. Um, are you selling drugs? And I said, they're not mine. And he, they said, who, who do they belong to? I said, these guys do it. Um, they, you know, and the police believed me because they saw that I was clean. They looked at me and they, they, they trusted what I said and they left. But what transpired after that was for the guys, when I walked in, they felt that I had dropped them in. So they shut the door and for 20 minutes, I was brutally beaten up. They had grabbed dumbbells, they had grabbed barbells and I was laying on the floor in a fetal position as they try and kick me over and over again. And all, all I could think was, I need, to, I, need to, I need to somehow protect my face because they're gonna smash my face. Mm -hmm. So for 20 minutes that, that continued and um, eventually I, you know, after it stopped, I got up and I looked at myself, I went into my room, I looked at myself in the mirror and I just broke down because I could not ring anybody. I didn't feel I had any close friends. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I couldn't ring my family for, for certain reasons. Um, and uh, at that point, I looked at my face. I couldn't recognize myself. My face, it, it, it didn't look like me. It was swollen. It was dirty. It was bloodied. And I think that was a turning, big turning point in my life because one of the things I realized at that point was that lack of money means lack of choices. Mm. So that was a turning point for me. And I realized that I needed to get this piece right because the only reason I was living with these guys was because I couldn't afford to rent on my own because I didn't have enough money. And, I, and for me, that was a big turning point. I realized I have to get this money thing right. Mm -hmm. So I got a job, a first job at a bank as a teller, um, counting cash. And I was terrible at counting cash. So we'd have... Every day, people had to stay back and help me count cash because there was more cash in the till. And I'd say to my manager, I said, what's the problem? Isn't it a good thing to have? And she'd say, no, it's not because how come you've got extra cash in your till? That means you're taking more money from, from others that, that you know, or there's a problem with counting money. So I'm thinking, my God, I can't even count cash. How am I going to become a money guy? Because mm -hmm. I need to get this money thing sorted. So what they did was they said, look, whilst we work out what we're going to do with you, we'd like you to stand at the door and just greet people. Mm -hmm. 
And so all I did was I stood, and this was, it had never been done in a bank before. Imagine just walking into a bank and you have somebody just to greet you and say hi. And this was, and we talked about in, in the mid nineties. So I just stand at the door, people would come in and I'd greet them. And it gave me a perfect opportunity to do a relationship with them and find out who they were. And I see all these wealthy people coming in. I see these big business people coming in. And instead of talking to them about what we did, I started asking them a lot of questions. And sometimes they'd be standing with me for 30 minutes and talking to me. Mm. And I started to get these insights about money. Then I sort of worked my way up and I ended up in a position doing financial advice after a while. But, and I remember going to my father and saying, dad, I'm a financial advisor. And my dad said, how can they make you a financial advisor? You're broke, <laughs> right? But back then the culture was that if you were very good at talking to people, connecting with people, which everybody observed, they said, he's very good at talking to people. People like him. And they, when they, sometimes they'd walk in and they would say, I want to speak to the manager. And they'd point at me. And the manager would get very upset. She'd say, are you telling people that you're the manager? I said, I've never told anyone I'm the manager. But for some reason, people assume that I'm the manager. Sure. So they realized that I was very good at connecting with people. So they gave me um, a position of a financial advisor back then. But I didn't realize it was a sales job. 18 months, I did that. And I hated it because all I had to do was sell financial products. Mm-hmm. I didn't really learn much about money, but from that point, from my early 20s, I worked very hard and I worked my way up into different parts of the bank, private bank, commercial bank, wealth management, funds management to learn about money. And as I learned about money, I got the money piece right by the time I was 31. I had accumulated sufficient money and assets, but the problem was I had a very, I I was not happy. I I would be coming home and I was always angry. Um, I had headaches. Um, and I couldn't wait to get out of work. And Friday, Saturday night, I would go and binge drink because there was something wrong. So I had the money piece right because I really wanted that bad. Mm-hmm. But what I didn't have was genuine confidence and alignment. So my real education actually started from 31, where I then spent a number of years being mentored by some incredible people, learning who I am, what I'm about, what my highest values are, what do I truly want in life, what I'm prepared to give up, what kind of legacy I want to leave. And that's when my true education started. So I'm 43, 44, just turned 44 uh, last week. And now for me, it's, it's about, yep, I still love a good life. But how I do that is really important. I must be authentic and inspired on the way of being financially abundant. But more importantly, I must use that financial abundance to add incredible value to others. Mm-hmm. So that's what's changed. And again, you know, life, so those are the, I suppose the bad things, but then again, if those things hadn't happened, sure. if I didn't, if I, and, and that also caused me to become extremely self-sufficient, knowing that I can't rely on anybody. Yes. When you know yes. you can't rely on anybody, you can't fall back on anybody, you become extremely independent, mm-hmm. right? And independence is one of my highest values. I hate relying on anybody. Maybe it's a bit extreme, um, but, you know, I suppose you can't, you, you always carry a chip on the shoulder with, you know, about some things that have happened to you in the past. Sure. But I see them as largely positive because those things that seemed bad at the time have made me the person that I am today. And uh, so I value all of those experiences now. Well, Ron, I appreciate sharing so much. And, you know, and I'm the same way. I mean, really my, my real school of life, my book of business that I thought was before really happened when I hit my lowest point in my life. And, you know, being faced with, you know, your backs against the wall or against the ropes and you have no choice but to fight or to die. And uh, through that, I mean, it was the most uncomfortable I've ever been. But man, it's like, a, it's like a caterpillar in a cocoon. It's the most uncomfortable a caterpillar is in a cocoon. And it's vibrating and so forth. And you can't just cut the cocoon and take the caterpillar out of butterfly because it's not going to survive. I mean, it has to vibrate. It has to, it has to fight. And finally, those wings break through the cocoon. Um, and that's why we need to feel that pain because, you know, someone said this to me recently is there's a fine line between pain and purpose. And when we're, we're going after our purpose, the pain is there because there's going to be things that we're going to have to give up. Uh, there's going to be things that we're going to have to do um, if we want to get to on the other side. And we've talked about this before. You know, many people in this world are chasing happiness. In, in lieu of chasing the truth. And I would love to get your perspective on that because I know we've had great conversations on, on Clubhouse about that. Yeah, yeah. I, I, like, I like the way you, you make that statement. Um, I think I've always done that. And you need a fair bit of courage to do that. 
And I think when you've been where you are, and, and I, I think for me, the rock bottom was when I rang, there's a company called Telstra in Australia, and I rang their lifeline because they have a, a suicide line specifically for people who are contemplating killing themselves. And I think that was the rock bottom for my life. And I think after that, once you, you know, I remember speaking to the guy for about 40 minutes and he talked me out of it. But I remember, I, I do feel that once you, and for me, that was the rock bottom point. And there's been several, but I, I do feel that once you've hit that rock bottom and you kind of, you, you get this thing about, you, I think something changes inside of you. You feel like you have nothing to lose anymore, right? Because you can't go any, you can't, it can't get any worse than that. Mm. And I think that does something to your spirit. I think you, it awakens your spirit. And I, and I do feel bad for people who haven't had significant adversity in life because I don't think sometimes their spirit wakes up. Mm. I think once you get to that point when you're awake and you and you at that point you're going, I really have nothing to lose. I might as well go all out and and have a really good crack at getting the life that I want because I've been so close to 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 experiencing death in in my mind. I had prepared myself for it, so right. not physically, right. but in my mind I had. Um, and I think I, I, so. I think that's a powerful point. And I think from that point you are not afraid of the truth anymore. You're not afraid. And you start to realize the brutality of life. Life is brutal. And one of the things, I, I, I just think that people who are expecting that life is going to turn out to be wonderful are the ones that end up being more disappointed than the ones that are expecting life to be brutal and unfair right from the beginning. Because they've experienced that brutality and that unfairness. Uh, you know, so because uh, I've experienced that, I don't expect anything to be fair. Yes. And that means that, that, that none of the, the brutality of life phases me. It doesn't discourage me. Um, the, the key point for me was that I don't want to become a cold person. What I don't want to become is this insensitive person who has become bitter because of life's experiences. Mm -hmm. Because I have seen people like that when they've gone through significant adversity right. or they right. feel like life's been brutal to them. One thing that it does is it, it closes their heart. And it... it, it um, I think it makes them bitter and skeptical. Mm -hmm. So when I when I've seen I've seen people like that, and I understand why they are the way they are. But what? But to me, the first thought was, I don't want to be like that. So how am I going to maintain a high sense of excitement and optimism about the future, and have faith in humanity when I have seen so much shit in my life, and I have see, I still see so much shit happening to others? How do you do that at that point? Because it's very hard to trust human beings after some of the things that you've experienced in life. You think, how the hell am I supposed to trust human beings now? Right. So okay. then, it, then it becomes a conscious decision to say, well, I don't want to close my heart. I don't want to lose faith in humanity because it, it won't be a great way to live. Mm -hmm. And I've got to try and understand the human condition. So that's when my spiritual education started. And because you can only understand the human condition, because you can see when you start your journey of developing, you start with skills-based or academic education then you go skills-based education then you go professional education then you, if you if you really evolved and you're not satisfied you go for personal development education business financial education and then you know the metaphysical education around law of attraction which i became very good at and i you know everybody who knows me says you're a master manifester you always get what you want but i still feel like there was a void i felt like there was a gap and the gap was that even though i Feel, I felt that I understood the laws of the universe metaphysically and I knew how to use them to my advantage. I've become very good at using my, my mind and priming my mind to get what I want. I felt that my relationship with this infinite intelligence was largely impersonal and I was using it for my own benefit. Mm -hmm. And my question was, is this infinite intelligence an impersonal entity or, is there a, or should I be looking to have a more personal relationship with it? And should I only be using the laws of the universe for my own benefit and fulfillment? Or do I have an obligation to go beyond and see if I should be that the, the access to infinite intelligence puts us in a, in a position of obligation to add value to the world? And so today where I stand with this is that I, I believe that the infinite intelligence, you can, you can have an impersonal relationship or you can have a personal relationship. It's up to you. I suppose it's a, an analogy that I'll use is my daughter... She's eight. She lives at home, obviously. She could acknowledge me as a good man. Or she could acknowledge me as a good dad. There is a difference. Yes. Both ways she's acknowledging me. But when she calls me a good dad, it's a bit more personal. 
Yes. Right. So one of the things I've found with the new age spirituality movement, and there are so many advocates of that, and I think it's wonderful because I think I think the new age spirituality takes people out of this victimhood and makes them realize that they can be very powerful when they understand the laws of the universe. Mm -hmm. But to me, it didn't satisfy me because I felt that it was an impersonal relationship, very similar to me, my daughter identifying me as a good man instead of identifying me as a good father. And so that's when I started to attempt to, and I, I got interested in religion because I, for, you know, for most of my life, I've, I haven't been religious and I felt that religion caused a lot of problems and I felt that people who followed religion were brainwashed. Mm -hmm. uh, but I wanted to study religion because people who are religious seem to have a personal relationship. But then over the years, I found that a lot of religious people are also indoctrinated to believe what they've been given, but they don't really question it. Right. So the question was, where am I going to find this answer? I mean, where, where do I go? If I want to have a personal relationship, I don't just want to acknowledge the, the presence of a universal intelligence. I don't just want to work with the laws of the universe and use them to my advantage but I want to go to the next step and see if I can build a personal relationship with it and I can find out. And rather than running my own agenda, I can see if I can download any intuitive insights about what is the agenda for me? Why, why was I born? Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and I hope I don't lose people when I say this, because the, the fact is we can, we can, development never stops. And my journey of development, when I thought, finally, I've got personal development, I don't need to know anything else. Finally, I know how business works. I don't need to know anything else. Mm -hmm. Finally, I know how wealth and investing works. I don't need to know anything else. Mm -hmm. Finally, I know how the laws of spiritual work. I don't need to know anything else. The fact is, there is always more. And are you the type of person who's seeking wisdom? Yes. Right? There is more. And I'm at that point where I, and this is where, and this is, by the way, also where the difference between, if you don't, if you, if you get to the point where you can, you know how to use the laws of, you know how to use your mind, to get what you want and you know how to use the laws of the universe to get what you want if you don't go beyond that the risk that you face is that you can have a lot of ego about your capabilities so you know when we talk about humility humility comes from the understanding that all of the things that you're able to do you are not able to you, it's not coming from your own intellect to your own capabilities you are borrowing a particular power that is available for anybody to use Mm -hmm. And when your intent is right, and when you're aligned, aligned within yourself, that power becomes available to you, but it's not yours. Therefore, there is no room for ego. There is no room for you to assume that you are more superior spiritually or mentally from anybody else. Certainly, we, I've done my part. I've got myself aligned, and I'm seeking wisdom, right? right? Yeah. And, but anybody can do that. There is no, there, that's why there's nothing special about individuals on our planet who have been able to transform humanity or have been able to, uh, who are some of the most evolved people on the planet, they're not geniuses per se. They have just identified, acknowledged mm -hmm. that there is a power and intelligence that exists beyond the human brain. They've got themselves aligned because a disconnected person can't, you're, you have to be working in harmony within yourself. And they have this constant pursuit of wisdom. So this is something that's available and accessible to everybody provided they, they are prepared to work on themselves. Right. And that becomes the choice that we always talk about is everybody has that choice, right? So, so Ron, I'm, I want to be very respectful of your time because I know you're in Australia in a time difference and it's a working day right now. Um, I do have two more questions for you. Um, the next question is the tombstone question. And the tombstone question is a question I ask all my guests, which is the day we meet our maker, we don't get to decide what's going to be put on our tombstone. Someone else will. What will you put on your tombstone? Well, well, I'm not going to decide that, obviously, but I hope that I would like, because I did this thing called your life statement, your life sentence, I beg your pardon, your life yeah. sentence. Yeah. And what I'd like, I hope that I'm able to accomplish this in my life, uh, that because of Ron, I, I realized that my potential was a lot higher than what I, what I felt it was. And that's all I want to do for the rest of my life. I just want to enable people magnify their lives. Mm -hmm. That's what gives me the most joy. It also brings out the best in me. So I, I assume that that's what my purpose in life would be because, uh, and I feel that a lot of downloads are given to me when I'm doing that as well. Whereas in other areas, when I'm just pursuing some selfish interests, I don't seem to have, I don't seem to be so aligned 
So all of those things are indicative, I, I believe, of the, of the fact that that's what I'm supposed to do with my life. Wow. And, you know, and I hear it when I hear it, when I talk to Caroline, talk to Eleanor, talk to Joanna, they all say the same messaging and you've given them permission to do that, given them permission to do so. And um, yeah, that, it's just wonderful. Um, Ron, what is the best way for people to, to follow you, to, to watch your content? Because I know you have a YouTube channel, you have a Facebook page. I mean, you are just a life teacher. You're always throwing so much value to the universe. So what's the best way for people to reach out to you? I think any of the, any of the social media, I love social media, by the way. I love it because it allows you to get your message across to people and it allows you to connect. I think when you're putting your message out consistently, apart from commercial considerations, you're building a business as well. The main benefit is that you allow people to make an informed choice whether you're their type of person, right? And so that's why I put a lot of stuff out because I, and because I know that if people have seen some of my stuff and decided after that, that they want to be connected with me, then what they're basically saying is, Ron, you and I are made of the same cloth, right? Let's connect. I have, you know, there's something, because that's what we do, right? I mean, I see myself as a, as a messenger, meaning that none of the messages are mine. I have also learned from other people. Mm -hmm. But but I feel I have the capability to see them. Sometimes I can see them differently and articulate them in a way that people who have heard that message before may not have comprehended it, but now it's making a little bit more sense to them. Um, so any of the platforms, I'm active on LinkedIn. I'm active on uh, Instagram, as you know. Um, and um, you know, and part of our, part of my job is to understand the principles of marketing and and use them to get our message as far and deep as possible which is what we're doing. So we're active on social media. So any of those platforms are fine. LinkedIn, Instagram, YouTube, Facebook. Fantastic. And we'll definitely put all the links in the show notes. So Ron, I just want to say thank you so much for your time. This has just been so wonderful. And, you know, I, I, like I said, I was so excited about this because I'm blessed that we get a chance to speak, you know, four or five times a week and to now share this with, with an audience, uh, I'm just so forever grateful. So thank you so much. No, thank you. I appreciate your gratitude. You've been very gracious and thank you for inviting me and uh, appreciate the, the great questions. Uh, I feel it's always, you know, if the host asks good questions, they bring out the best in their guest. So thank you for asking me the right questions today. Not a problem, Ron. Thank you so much again. Thank you, Mark.